Cash Logistics, the perfect inside job goes sideways. Written by Matthew B. Cox. Narrated by Keith Madison Miller. The bulky, square, armored truck jolted to a stop feet from the Bank of America branch, located in the center of the plaza. Garda's iconic red and white logo displayed on its side. Within its bowels was $1.5 million in cash. Fifty yards across the parking lot, behind the dumpsters, a 28-year-old black male watched from the driver's seat of a navy blue Chevy Monte Carlo with black rims and black tinted windows. He glanced between the dumpster. The grayish truck was sitting in front of the ATM machine just where he knew it would be. Cars lined the parking lot. Customers meandered in and out of the strip mall's shops and big-named anchor tenants. Home Depot, public supermarket. No one seemed to have noticed him. Despite the simmering Florida heat, he sat in the dark coop and waited. Feds watching by two chains was blaring out of the speakers. Jamar Nathaniel Towns knew all Garda Cash Logistics security procedures, their policies, their delivery routes, the ATM reload schedule. Still, he was uneasy. BB-sized beads of perspiration formed on his brow. This was nothing like the movies that had inspired him. The adrenaline-infused blood coursing through Jamar's veins caused his hands to tremble as he snapped off the stereo. People were laughing in the distance. He slipped on his gloves, rolled the black ski mask down his forehead, and pulled it taut over his face, revealing a twisted joker's grin made up of three-inch tall white letters. Stretching across the mouth of the mask were the words, American Greed. Jamar grabbed the neck of his AR-15 semi-automatic assault rifle, slid across the front seat, and popped open the Monte Carlo's passenger door. As he emerged from the vehicle, Jamar must have looked like the angel of death dressed entirely in black, grinning American greed from ear to ear, tucked inside a crook in Castle's hoodie with his assault rifle. He peeked over the dumpsters and saw the guard wearing a starched blue uniform over his Kevlar vest. Tucked into his holster was a flat black automatic pistol. The guard leaned out of the rear of the truck holding four cash reload canisters, each containing $50,000. He stepped onto the bumper, dropped to the asphalt, and headed toward the ATM. Jamar knew there was a possibility he could be killed. However, Garda policy stated not to engage a suspected robber in public, not to risk bodily harm, not to pursue. Jamar was nervous, but he liked his odds. As Jamar waited for the guard to return with the canvas bag full of cash, approximately half a million dollars, a woman in a minivan drove by, some suburbanite soccer mom do-gooder. She looked the angel of death in the eyes and reached for her cell phone. Jamar's level of anxiety spiked. He looked at his watch and noted the time. Suddenly, he heard the ATM door slam closed. It was time. Jamar came around the dumpster and bolted toward the truck. The guard had just opened the rear door when he spotted the armed figure. A ripple of fear ran through him. Drop the bag, yelled Jamar as he closed the distance between he and the guard. Drop it! Panicked, the guard froze for a fraction of a second. Then he jolted awake, released the bag, and dove through the partially open door. Somewhere behind him, a woman screamed. By the time 911 started receiving calls of the robbery, Jamar had sped out of the strip mall's parking lot with the bag and vanished. As Palm Beach Sheriff's cruisers and choppers converged on the location, it appeared that, once again, Jamar had pulled off the perfect heist. It's the summer of 2016, and a black drug dealer named Bam wants me to meet his homeboy sometime after dinner. He's got a crazy-ass case, Bam tells me. You gotta hear it. As a con man slash true crime writer locked away inside the Coleman Federal Correctional Complex in Central Florida, I get pitched stories all the time. Mobsters, kidnappers, tax cheats. Every inmate thinks they have a story. They all want to be George Young or Jordan Belford. Some of their stories interest me, but most don't. However, I like Bam, so I agree to meet with his homeboy at 6 p.m. outside our housing unit. Jamar Towns is an unlikely bank robber. In contrast to the loud, brutish, tattooed Neanderthals we're surrounded by with their gold teeth and dreadlocks, Jamar's athletic, around 5 foot 10 inches tall and soft-spoken. He considers himself reserved. However, Antisocial is a better description. In an overcrowded prison bustling with inmates, he has few friends and spends most of his time reading. I have yet to see him without a book in his hand. Sitting on the concrete benches in front of B unit with the dusk chasing the summer heat away, mosquitoes swarm around us. Almost in a whisper, 
Jamar tells me a story. I've avoided gangs and drugs my whole life, he says. I'm not a street guy. I'm not some kind of thug. Other than the multiple robberies that led him here, Jamar tells me, I've never stolen anything. The abortion money was lying on his 16-year-old mother's dresser, and Jamar was tucked inside her womb. Janine Towns had been saving for over a month. The procedure was scheduled for 4 p.m., shortly after school. When Janine's mother saw the cash, she knew what it was for. She wasn't happy about her daughter's decision, and the money was just sitting on the dresser. By the time Janine got home from school, it was gone, and her mother was unpacking the groceries. Frantically, she looked around the room, then asked her mother if she'd seen the cash on the dresser. She confessed to spending it on food for the celebratory family barbecue. To celebrate what? You having a baby. Jamar was born six months later, in May 1985, at St. Mary's Hospital, West Palm Beach, Florida. Over the next few years, his mother gave birth to two more boys and two girls, five children all struggling to grow up in Riviera Beach, a few miles south of Palm Beach, where the ultra-rich live. While people like Tiger Woods, Rush Limbaugh, and Donald Trump lived in huge, multi-million dollar mansions, drove exotic vehicles, and owned luxury yachts, Jamar and his siblings survived on spoonfuls of thick government peanut butter and mayonnaise sandwiches. During high school, Jamar's younger sister, Ashley, who'd always been a tomboy, began showing an interest in her female classmates. No one in the family was surprised. However, Ashley's sexual orientation caused problems for her and her brother. Kids would make cruel comments and start rumors. Jamar was constantly defending her. Sometime during Jamar's junior year, Ashley began flirting with a male Haitian student's girlfriend. The situation escalated into a confrontation. The Haitian and several of his friends jumped Ashley after school one day. They split her lip open and blackened both her eyes. She was covered with bruises. The day after the beating, there was an incident between the Haitian and his buddies and several of Jamar's friends, a confrontation which quickly turned into a brawl. The principal and the West Palm Beach Police Department forced Jamar and Ashley to change schools before things got out of control. Weeks later, Jamar obtained a basketball scholarship at R.J. Hendley High School, where he graduated in May 2003 with the second highest GPA in his class. Go talk to her, hissed Mike, Jamar's buddy. Michael Sheffield wasn't quite five foot six inches. However, he was bulldog husky and chihuahua enthusiastic. The two couldn't have been more different. Mike was loud and outgoing, a brazen risk taker. While Jamar juggled night courses at Palm Beach State College and working full-time as a forklift operator at Walgreens Warehouse, Mike spent most of his time playing pranks on his fellow employees, dodging his supervisor and selling Xanax and Roxy's on the side. By November 2007, they were best friends. The two 20-somethings were huddled together in the Walgreens employee cafeteria, gawking at a curvy, light-skinned chick who was working in the packaging department. She had Halle Berry hair and good looks. Go over there and talk to her. Her curious glances had become a stare. Suddenly, Jamar didn't have a chance but to introduce himself. Zaire was a 21-year-old single mother. He wasn't like the other guys, Zaire replies during one of our interviews when I ask her about her first impression of Jamar. He was quiet, shy, strong, but soft, you know. He smiled at me and I fell in love. I remember thinking, I'm going to marry this guy. That's my man. Over the next year, they did the whole dinners and movie thing. They took Zaire's daughter to Florida theme parks and the beach. Jamar liked Zaire, but she wanted more than the occasional date. He wasn't interested in being a father or any of the drama that came with a serious relationship. During a semi-break in the relationship, Jamar hooked up with a caramel-skinned petite hottie named Nicole, a payroll administrator for a cement company called CMEX. It wasn't serious until Nicole told him she was pregnant. Jamar was still trying to wrap his head around the news when, two weeks later, Zaire stopped by his apartment to let him know she'd missed her period. Jamar, the guy who didn't want a relationship, now had two pregnant girlfriends and a whole lot of drama. Throughout early 2009, Jamar juggled OBGYN appointments, sonograms, and ultrasounds while simultaneously working the night shift at Walgreens. His children were born in July and August 2009. Zaire wasn't thrilled. However, I love Jamar, she says, so I was willing to deal with the situation. Nicole, at the time, was furious, irrational, determined to make Jamar's life hell. She'd scream at him, call the police and say Jamar had a gun and he was selling drugs out of his apartment. The police would show up, search his place, and find nothing. 
The officers would ask Jamar if he wanted to press charges for the false report. He never did. Eventually, in late 2009, Nicole physically attacked him. Despite Jamar refusing to press charges, the officers arrested her for domestic violence. The charge was later dropped. Ashley Towns was a troubled soul. She was also what Jamar refers to as street, criminal-minded, a street-savvy hustler. On December 3rd, 2009, Ashley sold coke to an undercover officer with the Palm Springs Narcotics Unit. She took off running, but between the helicopter and the canine unit's German shepherds, she was tracked down and arrested for trafficking in cocaine. Ashley was sentenced to 24 months in the Florida Department of Corrections. In the midst of the chaos, Jamar was studying to be an EMT, emergency medical technician, at Kieser Career College. Between his course load and the mandatory ride-alongs with the fire department, he couldn't continue working at the warehouse. By year-end, he'd aced all his EMT courses. However, in early 2010, Jamar ran into a problem with the state of Florida's EMT exam. I failed it, he told Mike. This is the third time I've failed it. Jamar had graduated Kieser at the top of his class, but the state exam had proved impossible to pass. You're going to take it again? I failed it three times, he exclaimed, at $200 a pop. Jamar couldn't afford to take the exam again. He could go back to Walgreens, but after five years, Jamar knew there was no chance of advancement there. What about being an armed security guard, suggested Mike. Some of those guys make real money. It wasn't a bad idea. All Jamar had to do was acquire his Florida concealed weapons permit. Unlike Mike, Jamar had no criminal record. He breezed through the six-week course at Gator Guns in West Palm Beach. The license arrived in the mail sometime in the summer of 2010. Jamar went on CareerBuilder.com and applied with Brink Security, Garda Cash Logistics, Loomis, etc. He accepted a position at G4S, a security company that specialized in providing community security. Jamar worked gate security at San Michel in Palm Beach Gardens, guarding multi-million dollar mansions, waving to the wealthy residents as they passed through the gated entrance in their Bentleys and Beamers. It wasn't a bad gig, but there wasn't much room for advancement. Then, in December 2011, he got the call from Garda Cash Logistics Human Resources Department. They were the third largest logistics company in the industry, moving billions of dollars every year. The human resources woman insisted they were growing and their company was ripe with opportunity for advancement. During the first few months, Jamar was trained for a variety of positions, driver, messenger, receiver, and jumper. That's the guard in the back responsible for servicing ATM machines. They trained him how to handle currency and label bags, the residential and commercial routes, how to lay out and create the delivery manifests. The whole operation was run out of the Garda Cash Logistics Armored Truck Depot, located in a fortified warehouse on Gardner Road in Riviera Beach. In May 2012, something strange happened. A female driver lost a bag containing $30,000. The police searched her vehicle and found the cash. She was fired but never charged. Days later, Jamar was working as a receiver, inventorying bags and logging them into Garda's logistics system as the trucks arrived. While scanning one of the messenger's deposits, a guy named Tool, Jamar noticed he was short one bag. There's only 15 bags, said Jamar. The manifest indicated there should have been 16. Tool shrugged. Maybe it's still in the truck, he replied, and walked to the underroof parking garage within the warehouse. A minute later, Tool returned without the missing bag. He told Jamar he must have accidentally scanned the same bag twice, which was possible. Jamar made a note in the system regarding the missing bag and moved to the next deposit. The following morning, his manager questioned Jamar about the missing bag. Apparently, there had been a 16th bag containing $40,000, but it was gone. Jamar was sure Tool was going to lose his job, but nothing happened. Instead, a week later, Tool showed up at work riding a new Suzuki GSX motorcycle. He shot Jamar a mischievous grin and a wink, and Jamar knew he'd taken the money. Jamar emerged from the U-Haul truck as Mike stepped out of his vehicle. It was June 2012. Jamar and Zaire were moving into an apartment together, trying to make the relationship work. Jamar's sister had recently been released from Florida State Prison, and money was tight. I gotta talk to you, said Mike. He'd recruited two experienced robbers, street guys straight out of the federal prison system. Weeks earlier, Mike had mentioned robbing Garda, but Jamar thought he was messing around, joking like he always did. One of these guys used to rob banks. 
I thought this was supposed to be you and me. The idea of robbing Garda had been a theoretical scenario, abstract, but it was becoming real serious, real quick. Jamar knew it was possible. It was happening all the time. However, he also knew if he was going to get involved, it wasn't going to be for 30 or 40 grand. Trust me, replied Mike. These guys are professionals. That night, he and Zaire watched the movie Heat, starring Robert De Niro as Neil McCauley, the leader of a military-style crew who commits heist across L.A. Jamar had seen the movie before, but this time he paid extra attention to the armored truck robbery, how the crew cut off the truck en route, how they knew the police response time. Jamar noticed how Neil, Chris, Sarito, and Wangro moved in with their AR-15 assault rifles, their use of masks, Kevlar vests, and gloves. How they covered the three guards and blew open the rear doors of the truck using a shape charge. Then, Neil checked his watch and growled. Eight seconds left, move it. They entered the truck, ignored the cash, and grabbed the package, containing $1.6 million in negotiable treasury certificates. His watch read 38 seconds as they exited the vehicle. Move out. It looked like the perfect score. Then suddenly, the whole thing went sideways. Wangro shot a guard for no apparent reason. It was no longer a simple robbery, it was now murder, and there was no reason to leave any witnesses. Neil and Cerrito executed the two remaining guards, and in a matter of seconds, the perfect crime evaporated. It doesn't have to go like that, Jamar remembers thinking. No one has to get hurt. The next morning, Jamar began paying attention to the security procedures at the depot. The locations of cameras, the angles, where the recorders were kept, how many armed employees were located on the trucks or in the warehouse at any given time, which guards considered themselves supermen willing to get into a shootout over Garda's cash, ex-cops, ex-military types. Within weeks, Mike pulled into Jamar's apartment parking lot a black 1987 Chevy El Camino. The paint was faded and the dashboard was cracked. Still, Jamar thought it was the coolest thing ever. It's yours, said Mike. He knew Jamar had always wanted an El Camino but could never afford one. This is mine? He yelped excitedly. You're saying this is mine? Yeah, but we gotta do something real quick. One of Mike's guys wanted to meet Jamar. There was no plan to go over. Jamar was still watching for weaknesses in security. But Mike's guy wanted to know if he'd go through with the heist. They met in the rear of a storage facility on Belvedere Road and I-95, wedged between two rows of nearly 100 units. Daryl Dewey Peterkine was sitting in a brand new red Dodge Magnum and when he got out of the vehicle, he kept going and going. Dewey was a foot taller than Jamar and nearly a foot and a half taller than Mike, six foot nine inches with golds and a glossy bald head. Everything about him was street, greasy, savage, the kind of goon Jamar had spent his entire life avoiding. How much are we talking about? asked Dewey. Jamar told him the trucks typically contain roughly a million dollars, sometimes more, and Dewey flashed a sinister grin. What Jamar didn't know was the almost incestuous connection between Dewey and the numerous members of his inner circle. His crew, his den of thieves, was made up of bank robbers, getaway drivers, gunmen, murderers, and money launderers, all woven together through a complicated family tree of blood and baby mamas. There was Dewey's brother, Alan Bolo Asbury. Bolo stands for Be On The Lookout. Shanti Hollis and her brother, Melvin Hollis, Dewey's girlfriend, Shanika Michelle Wilkins, and Dewey's sister, Shafre Richardson. Here's where it gets complicated. Kelby Parson, a robber with Dewey's crew, Baby's Mama, is Dewey's wife's sister. And Parson's other baby mama is the sister of Sikori, Joe Rock Wilder, another robber in Dewey's crew. Still another robber is Dwayne Wee Wee Shepherd. Joe Rock and Wee Wee were cousins. Don't bother trying to make sense or the connections. It's enough to know they were more than a gang. They were family. Everyone was involved in crime. Everyone had a criminal record. Everyone had done time. And everyone else was fair game. Garda Cash Logistics had numerous security procedures and policies for the movement of currency. Procedures and policies that weren't being followed. There were always supposed to be three guards on commercial and ATM armored trucks. However, Jamar noted that there were never more than two. Also, at any given time, there should have been an additional three guards at the depot, but that was seldom the case. The most glaring gap in Garda security occurred on Sunday nights between midnight and 1 a.m. That's when Garda transported the week's currency, roughly $20 million in cash, from Miami to the Riviera Beach warehouse. There was supposed to be three guards, an armored truck, and a decoy vehicle. 
However, despite company policy, Garda had scaled their transports back to two guards, one armored truck, and no decoy. Jamar was one of the two Garda guards. They met underneath the streetlight outside Dewey's place in Monroe Heights. It was after dark, and Jamar wasn't happy. Dewey had Joe Rock with him, a shorter, more muscular version of Dewey, and he told him everything. Too many people know about this, thought Jamar. He went over what he felt was a simple plan, over and over again. All you've got to do is wait behind the bushes beside the warehouse, said Jamar, for the third time. After I get out of the truck, I'll open the outside door, and you run up behind me with the gun. You push me inside the warehouse, the driver won't be able to see you from where he's parked, but the cameras can. Once inside, Jamar would deactivate the alarm and open the large garage door for the truck. After the driver pulled into the warehouse, Dewey and Joe Rock were to zip tie him and Jamar. Get the money out of the back of the truck and take off. How come you can't grab the driver while you're in the truck? Asked Dewey. Are you serious? The guy knows me. Jamar explained that if he were willing to expose his involvement, I wouldn't need either of you. Dewey and Joe Rock nodded in unison like a couple of mindless plastic dashboard bobbleheads. The following Sunday night, Jamar walked out of the warehouse in Miami. He and the driver had loaded two pallets of currency, roughly $18 million wrapped in cellophane, into the rear of the truck. As he locked the back doors, Jamar called Dewey. I'm leaving, was all he said before disconnecting. Two hours later, the truck pulled into the parking lot of the Riviera Beach Depot. Jamar hopped out, unlocked, and opened the heavy steel door. He stalled for a second, anticipating the barrel of Dewey's weapon at his back. But it didn't come. Jamar entered the building, expected Dewey would rush in behind him. He didn't. Jamar disarmed the alarm and opened the garage door, thinking Dewey might come through the open garage door. Nothing. We just froze, my nigga, you know what I'm saying? Dewey later told him. He tried to blame his trepidation on Mike's involvement. He wanted to do it with just Joe Rock and his brother, Bolo. Jamar reluctantly agreed. You know how it is, next time, next time. Two weeks later, Dewey and Joe Rock crouched in the bushes, again, but at the crucial moment, they froze, again. What the fuck? barked Jamar when he and Dewey met up. They were standing in the industrial area parking lot across from the Riviera Beach Police Department, staring at a dozen cruisers. He told Jamar there were too many cameras. They didn't feel good about the plan. We're thinking we should just grab the driver's wife or kid the night before him. What are you talking about? I'm not kidnapping anyone, hissed Jamar. Look, look, I'll come up with another plan. We're not kidnapping anyone. The second plan was no more successful. Dewey and Joe Rock were to cut off the truck en route, jump out of their vehicle, and rob Jamar and the second guard as they returned to the warehouse. But they managed to screw that up, too. After the fourth, or maybe it was the fifth, failed attempt, Jamar came to the conclusion it wasn't going to work out. These guys weren't professionals. They were just clowns. She was a thick, ghetto, sexy black girl that had been working at Garda for less than a month. Terry, not a real name, was tall and curvy. All the guys wanted to get with her. Jamar was working as a receiver, inventorying several bags from SunTrust Bank, when Terry casually slipped up beside him. I know what you're planning, she said, slightly above a whisper. You need to call me. At the time, Jamar had given up on the idea of robbing Garda, but the comment sent a jolt of fear through him. Go on, Terry, he grunted and waved her off. I'm working here. He didn't call her, and within a week, she stopped showing up for her shifts. In the midst of the numerous botched robbery attempts, Jamar's manager, Amanda, asked him to step into her office. Tom, the supervisor, was slumped in a guest chair looking at the flat screen on Amanda's desk. Prominently displayed on the screen was a grainy frozen image of Dewey and Joe Rock climbing out of a nondescript truck. The image had been captured by one of the parking lot cameras. Amanda looked at Jamar and asked, Have you noticed anything unusual? Anyone following the trucks or loitering around the warehouse? Mm, no, he replied, staring at his co-conspirators. Tom glanced uneasily at Amanda and sighed. Well, he mumbled, something's going on. Jamar was certain that they suspected he was involved until Amanda asked if he'd consider taking a position as a supervisor. It comes with a raise, $16 an hour, plus overtime. Just before Jamar left, Tom informed him and Amanda that the security at Garda's new transfer facility was state-of-the-art. 
The entire Riviera Beach operation was scheduled to be relocated by the end of September. They'd already moved the forklifts and a lot of the furniture. Until then, Tom said, keep your eyes open. Shortly after being made a supervisor, Jamar was assigned the warehouse weekend shift. He and a second Guardia employee were in charge of assigning routes, receiving and allocating cash to ATM machines. However, within weeks, Amanda was scheduling Jamar to work alone at the warehouse. Other employees were scheduled, but they regularly came in late and left early. On his way back from dropping off $100,000 in currency to a Bank of America branch, another job that Jamar never should have been assigned to do alone, he pulled into the empty parking lot at the vacant warehouse, and Jamar had an epiphany. Why not just rob the whole depot? He was alone for hours at a time during the weekends. Jamar met Dewey just after his shift ended. All you gotta do is grab me outside. You don't even need a gun. You can use mine and walk me into the warehouse. The safes, three of them, approximately six foot high and five foot deep, would be unlocked. Jamar was very clear about this. You're gonna need a truck, like an F-150 or Suburban, it's a lot of cash. A lot of ones, fives, tens, and twenties. It's bulky. How much? At least 11 million. But they're moving. If it don't happen this weekend, it ain't never going to happen. On September 15th, 2012, around 7 p.m., Jamar stepped into the employee restroom. All but one of the trucks had come in, and all of the guards had gone home. The warehouse was empty. He pulled the track phone out of his pants pocket and called Dewey. It's a go, was all Jamar said before the cell phone went dead. Out of minutes. Jamar couldn't call Dewey's cell phone using his iPhone, so he called his sister and asked her to call Dewey's cell three-way. By the time Jamar stepped out of the restroom and back into the view of the multiple security cameras, Dewey was on his way to the depot. Jamar shuffled around the warehouse for a few minutes, looking bored. Then he began gathering up the garbage and tossing it into the trash bin. He glanced at his watch. The final truck had an ETA of 20 minutes. He opened the garage door to the warehouse and pushed the bin toward the industrial complex's dumpster, roughly 75 yards away. Halfway there, he noticed a Chevy S10 in his peripheral vision, the smallest production pickup ever manufactured by a U.S. automaker. Not nearly large enough to hold the contents of the safes, but it was too late. The truck pulled up beside him, and Dewey exited the Chevy with an AK-47 semi-automatic assault rifle at his side. He pushed the barrel into Jamar's back and yanked the 9mm Ruger out of his holster. Let's do this, bitch, growled Dewey. Then he grabbed Jamar by the collar, wheeled him around, and pushed him toward the depot. Suddenly, there was an aggressiveness to Dewey Jamar hadn't experienced before. His eyes were bloodshot with thin veins. He seemed unpredictable, dangerous. For the first time, Jamar wondered if leaving him alive was part of Dewey's plan. His heart began thumping and his brow immediately started to perspire. Within a minute, Joe Rock had backed the Chevy into the underroof parking area of the warehouse, and Dewey had walked Jamar into Amanda's office, prodding him with the AK-47 for the cameras. The plan was to retrieve the VHS cassettes from the recorders, but they were gone. The station was empty, except for some loose cords and screws. Where they at? snapped Dewey. They must have moved all the equipment to the new location. A quick search revealed a harness of cords in a closet, which Dewey severed using a pair of wire cutters. However, they had no idea if the system had been disabled. Jamar checked his watch. The truck and its armed guards would be there in less than 15 minutes. Dewey pushed Jamar into the fenced-off area of the warehouse that contained the safes. Joe Rock was standing idle, staring at the three massive black steel boxes. What are you doing? hissed Jamar. They're unlocked. The truck will be here any minute. Joe Rock yanked open the door, revealing shelf after shelf stacked with blocks of vacuum-sealed currency bound for the Bank of America, SunTrust, Wachovia, and TD Bank. As Dewey duct-taped Jamar for the cameras, Joe Rock transported the bricks of cash, each containing anywhere from 10000 to 100000 to the bed of the Chevy. Dewey dug into Jamar's pocket and relieved him of his iPhone and track phone. As Jamar feared, the teeny tiny truck bed filled to capacity before the second safe was empty. It was so full the tarp couldn't cover the bulk of cash. Dewey and Joe Rock had to toss several blocks out, leaving nearly a million dollars lying on the garage's oily concrete floor along with Jamar. Just before Dewey climbed into the Chevy, he slammed the butt of his assault rifle into the back of Jamar's head, which was something they'd never discussed, hitting him again and again, almost knocking Jamar unconscious. After the fifth or sixth impact, Jamar was certain Dewey was going to crush his skull and leave him for dead. Then, as suddenly as the beating began, it stopped. 
As Jamar was lying on the floor bleeding, surrounded by blocks of currency, the pickup's tire squealed in front of his face, raced out of the garage, and disappeared. Twenty minutes later, Garda's last armored truck pulled into the parking lot. By the time Jamar stepped out of the ambulance, around 8 p.m., several detectives with the Riviera Beach Police Department and a couple of FBI agents were waiting for him. Dewey, Joe Rock, and Bolo barged into Sahara Woods' house sometime before midnight. Dewey had been sleeping with Sahara on and off for years. She was a homegirl from the streets of Riviera Beach that was down for whatever. He considered her place a safe house. Using a razor knife, they slashed the cellophane-wrapped blocks open and dumped the currency on Sahara's bed. There was so much cash, part of it spilled onto the floor. One big pile of crisp, clean greenbacks. Joe Rock and Bolo sorted the bills into piles of George Washington's, Benjamin Franklin's, Andrew Jackson's, etc. Dewey counted it, stacked the cash into bundles of $50,000, and wrapped them in rubber bands. Sahara stood in the doorway of her bedroom and watched the bundles grow from $50,000 to $100,000 while listening to Dewey brag about the heist. Over the next few hours, the take went from half a million to a million, then to two million. As Dewey counted out the last million, he laughed at the brilliance of the plan, the precision of their execution, their skill, and, unfortunately for Jamar, the inside man that put it all together. Shortly after midnight, Jamar was led into an interview room at the Riviera Beach Police Department. It was occupied by two detectives with the Riviera Beach Robbery Unit and four FBI agents. Jamar was asked to describe the ambush outside the warehouse and the events that led up to the robbery. Why didn't you fire on them, spat one detective. With what, he replied, the robbers had taken Jamar's Ruger. They had AKs, checked the cameras, I was unarmed. The second detective interjected something about protecting the money, and Jamar responded, I ain't getting shot for 16 bucks an hour. It's not my money. During the three-hour interrogation, while the detectives rapidly fired questions at Jamar, the FBI agents never said a word. They took notes, and they observed, but they never said a word. The next morning, after he'd stumbled out of the police station at 4 a.m. to find Zaire waiting in the parking lot, after she'd taken him home and given him a bath, he laid in bed wondering if the authorities would put it together. After Zaire had left for work, FBI agents John McVeigh and Scott Wilson knocked on the door of Jamar's apartment. Standing in the living room were two average-looking white government agents. Average height, average weight, average generic gray suits. McVeigh and Wilson explained they needed to clear up some inconsistencies with Jamar's story. They asked about several calls he'd made while at work, using his personal cell phone, not the track phone. Calls to Zaire, his sister. They asked him to go over the robbery again, which he did. Agent McVeigh was agitated but clueless as to Jamar's involvement. The more they asked, the more obvious it was they didn't have anything on him. He'd pulled off the perfect heist. Sahara's brother stepped into the partitioned-off visitation booth at the West Palm Beach County Detention Center, commonly known as Gun Club. He smiled at her through the plexiglass. Sitting on the counter was a copy of the Palm Beach Post. Terrell Wood had recently pled guilty to possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. Subsequently, he was enhanced under the career criminal statute. He was months away from being sentenced to a 15-year minimum mandatory. Per federal statute, there's only one way to breach a minimum mandatory cooperation. I got you, bro, said Sahara into the visitation phone's receiver. I'm getting you out of here. Sahara held the post up to the glass partition. The headline read, Garda Depot robbed. She proceeded to tell her brother that Dewey and his co-conspirators had counted out the money at her residence. Sahara knew all the players. The siblings had grown up with them on the streets of Riviera Beach. They got over three million dollars and all you got to do is call the feds, big bro. That's all you got to do. Cooperating with law enforcement and snitching out your homeboys is dangerous, but so is doing 15 years in a federal penitentiary. According to Jamar, Terrell was on the phone with Agent McVeigh within less than an hour. Roughly a week later, the morning of September 29th, the agents were back. This time, they banged on Jamar's door. This time, they insisted he accompany them to the federal building in downtown West Palm Beach. When they got to the sixth floor of the FBI's field office, there was a polygraph examiner waiting for him. Agent Wilson told him, it'll only take a few minutes. We're just trying to exclude you from our pool of suspects. Jamar knew something had changed. Nah, he grunted. I don't trust it. I don't want to take it. I ain't got nothing else to say. He hired Frank Prince, a criminal defense attorney. 
Prince assured Jamar the best course of action was to answer the FBI's questions to clear everything up. On October 19, 2012, they met at the FBI's field office. Jamar went over the robbery again, and the agents asked several accusatory questions. Prince didn't say much in his defense. They showed him a photo of the Chevy S10, the truck Dewey had insisted he was going to torch after the robbery, and his heart sank. It was the first concrete piece of evidence Jamar had seen. The agents told him they were closing in on the suspects. They placed a dozen mugshots on the table in front of him and asked if Jamar recognized anyone. He didn't. Jamar later found out that Joe Rock's face was among the photos, however, he didn't recognize it. Michael Sheffield's mugshot wasn't among the photos, nor was Dewey's, or anyone else he recognized. You know Dwayne Shepard or Sikori Wilder? asked Agent McVeigh. Jamar shook his head. What about Linsky Montal, Shafre Richardson, Alan Asbury, Angelo Bajimi, Michael Sheffield? Jamar only knew Dewey, Joe Rock, and Bolo by their street names. He didn't recognize their legal names. However, he did recognize Mike's names. No, sir, they don't sound familiar. They don't sound familiar? Agent McVeigh shot back. You don't recognize the name Michael Sheffield? Michael Sheffield. No, sir. Eventually, sighed McVeigh, we're going to get everyone involved. He stared deep into Jamar's eyes and continued, every single one of them. That's when Wilson removed Jamar's iPhone, the phone Dewey had assured Jamar he'd disposed of from an evidence bag, and asked, does this look familiar? Here's where it gets complicated. Dewey's wife's sister's baby's daddy, Kelby Parson, a 33-year-old black male who was also one of Dewey's crew, was approached by his homeboy shortly after Dewey's big score. He was angry. Dewey had originally agreed to include him in the robbery, but days before, Dewey had changed his mind. Now Dewey and Joe Rock were sitting on millions in cash. I had this tracking service, says Parson during one of our interviews at the Coleman Federal Complex. He had acquired the GPS tracker at a spy shop in Miami. I put it on Dewey's vehicle and traced him on my laptop. Parson tracked Dewey's movements for two weeks. Mostly, he stayed in the Riviera Beach area, bouncing from friends and family members' homes. However, he did go to a trailer park in Port St. Lucie, but according to Parson, it was a dead end. That's how I found Shanika Wilkins' house. She's Dewey's sad girl. After watching Wilkins' movements for a few days, Parson broke into her residence. He searched it. But I didn't find nothing. It really didn't matter about the money, Parson tells me. He and a partner had been watching Garda's new transfer station in West Palm Beach for months. They knew the armored truck's routines, and they'd been waiting for the right moment to hit one. However, knowing that Dewey had robbed the Garda Cash Logistics Depot for $3 million, they decided to make their move. It was only a matter of time before someone else in the crew smashed the truck, said Parsons. And my homeboy didn't want to lose that money, too. Despite the FBI's investigation, Jamar was still attending night courses at Strayer University's West Palm Beach campus. He was sitting in his intro to business class, waiting for the instructor to begin the lecture trying to convince himself the agents didn't have enough evidence to arrest him. When a fellow student, an off-duty police officer Jamar had never spoken to, turned to face him. You know those guys that hit that armored truck place? Said the officer. Mark my words, the feds are going to bust them any day now. He told Jamar the robbers would eventually screw up and the FBI would pounce. They'll get them. What are you telling me this for? Asked Jamar, perplexed. They didn't know one another. They'd never even spoken. The officer gave Jamar a quizzical half shrug. I thought you worked there. Why would you think that? You usually come in here with your Garda uniform. You work there, right? Jamar was so shaken by the conversation, he left class. He never went back into his intro business class or any other classes. Mike and Dewey knew not to contact Jamar. They discussed the possibility that the FBI might watch him for a few months. However, by early November, Jamar's workman's compensation wasn't enough to cover his bills. He called Mike and then his sister, Ashley, using someone else's phone, and asked them to pick up his third of the $3 million. Dewey wanted to meet with Jamar personally, but he refused. Jamar was certain the FBI was watching him. Every time he turned around, he thought he spotted an agent or an unmarked car. Instead, a drop was arranged where Ashley picked up her brother's percentage stuffed in a bag. The second Jamar saw the bundles of cash, he knew it was short. He counted it twice, 300000 and called Dewey. Where's the other 700000 you got a ticket? Slang for a million dollars, he replied. Nah, man, sighed Jamar. I got 300000 That's on you, motherfucker, barked Dewey. I gave you a bitch a ticket. Jamar knew Dewey was screwing him out of his cut, but there wasn't much he could do. Dewey and his crew were on the FBI's radar, and Jamar didn't want to be around if things went bad. We straight? Yeah, we straight. 
Jamar caught up some bills and slipped Mike $50,000. Shortly after Jamar got the cash, Zaire started doubting his story. Tell me you weren't involved in the robbery, she asked one evening. The question came out of nowhere. It was so unexpected, Jamar struggled for the appropriate response. In that moment of hesitation, Zaire, the person closest to him, recognized the deception. No, 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 what have you done? Nothing, I didn't do anything. I got robbed, that's all. She threw her hands up to her face and cried. What have you done? What have you done? She didn't believe his denials. Within days, Jamar moved out of their apartment. The decision was based on many factors, but the primary reason was Zaire's disappointment in him. He couldn't stand the look of disgust in her eyes. He betrayed her. He felt like a stranger in his own home. Strippers, alcohol, and drugs seemed appropriate given the situation. A band-aid for Jamar's broken heart. A prescription for loneliness. He and several guys were partying at Flash Dance, a gentleman's club in West Palm. Jamar was drinking Remy Martin and Red Bull while the boys were throwing cash at the gorgeous exotic dancers on stage. The club was packed with customers, and Meek Mill was singing Dreams and Nightmares. Duchess was dancing for some customer, but she never took her eyes off Jamar. He was sporting a combination of true religion and Aku, polo leather boots, and an MK watch. She was a slim, caramel-skinned Ethiopian with a bodacious body, according to Jamar, five foot ten inches with heels and silky black Brazilian hair. He called her the next day. Less than a week later, they met at a hotel. They parked their stolen getaway car in the adjacent Walmart parking lot near Garda's new transfer station in West Palm Beach. It was 4 a.m. Parson used a hacksaw to cut through the steel bars of the fence surrounding the building. This gave them access to the building's exterior and the parking lot. Dressed in black, ski masks, gloves, and Kevlar vests, the two men crouched in the shrubs and waited for the truck to arrive, an estimated $5 million in its coffer. They waited and waited and waited. Then, just before 7 a.m., as dawn broke, the truck pulled into the parking lot and slowly backed up to the transfer station's garage. The driver stepped out, and Parson and his partner rushed out of the bushes with their AK-47 semi-auto assault rifles held high and tight to their shoulders. Parson yelled, Don't move or you're fucking dead. The driver threw his hands up and screamed, Take whatever you want. As Parson's partner raced around the back of the truck, Parson entered the driver's side. He didn't see the guard sitting in the back of the vehicle holding his 9mm semi-auto Glock until it was too late. There was a loud pop. The round struck him in the mouth, blew a hole through his lower lip, shattering his front teeth and jaw. The impact threw Parson out the open door. He hit the asphalt and blacked out for a second. There was blood everywhere. In the confusion, his partner took off running for their getaway vehicle, leaving Parson on the pavement. Parsons struggled to his feet, grabbed his assault rifle, and a dozen shards of broken teeth off the ground and followed him. While Parson was in surgery having the bullet removed, St. Mary's Medical Center notified the police. The FBI took a DNA swab and matched it to the blood left at the transfer station. Parson was arrested less than a week later and, within a year, sentenced to 12 years in federal prison. His partner was never apprehended. Jamar heard about the failed robbery on the evening news. He immediately knew the events were connected. By the end of the year, agents McVeigh and Wilson had not only linked Jamar to Mike via his cell phone records, but they'd also discovered the origin of their connection, Walgreens. However, when the agents tried to speak with Mike, he refused to admit any knowledge of the Garda heist or Jamar. On December 24, 2012, Mike and Jamar met at Jamar's grandmother's house. They discussed their concerns over the FBI's investigation, and Mike raged over Dewey, shorting Jamar out of his cut. I'm going to get that cash, bro, he said over and over. Jamar told him not to worry about it, not to do anything stupid. The money was gone. It's over. I put the word out, replied Mike, ignoring Jamar. I got a couple guys. I'm going to get the money, bro. Jamar took the statement to mean Mike was going to have Dewey's place burglarized or set him up to be robbed. Dewey had made some mistakes. He'd bragged to his crew about the millions in cash, but he hadn't broken them off. He hadn't spread the love. Instead, Dewey and Joe Rock had split the funds. Several members of the crew felt shorted, and now his homeboys were turning on him. They were looking for the money, looking to rob him. However, in Mike's attempt to retrieve the money, he'd failed to take three factors into consideration. One, Mike was the only direct link connecting Jamar to Dewey. Two, he wasn't family, and three, 
Not unlike Jimmy the Gent in the movie Goodfellas, it was cheaper to have Mike and Jamar killed than to hand them over nearly three quarters of a million dollars. Be safe, bro. That was the last thing Jamar said to his friend before he left. A little over two weeks later, around 12.40 a.m., January 9, 2013, Mike pulled his silver Dodge Magnum in front of his parents' house. The neighborhood street lights were on. However, it's doubtful Mike noticed the man waiting for him. He may have been sitting in a nondescript vehicle at the curb or standing in the adjacent alley. What is known is as Mike approached the door, the man fired over a dozen shots into him. Seconds later, his father opened the door holding his gun. He found his son's body lying motionless on the front stoop. Despite not seeing anyone, he fired off several rounds into the air, hoping to frighten off the gunman. Shortly after the police arrived, according to Parson, Dewey drove by the scene with Joe Rock. There were a dozen patrol cars scattered around the neighborhood. Crime tape held back the curious as the forensic lab processed the scene. There were lots of blue lights and uniforms. Dewey turned to Joe Rock. See that, he said. That's my work. Jamar was lying in bed with Zaire when his lawyer, Prince, called. Mr. Towns, I just got off the phone with the FBI, he informed Jamar. In spite of Jamar denying any knowledge of Mike, Agent McVeigh wanted to inform Jamar about his murder. Before the attorney had finished, Jamar's hands were trembling with anxiety over the loss. They said he was shot 14 times. It might be unrelated to the robbery, but if you did know him, and it is related, you could be in danger. Jamar mumbled, I didn't know him, and hung up the phone. He recalled crying throughout the day and into the night with Zaire beside him. Mike was the only true friend Jamar had ever had. Everything was spiraling out of control. Dewey and most of his crew had been picked up and questioned by Agent McVeigh and Wilson. They denied knowing anything about the robbery or the murder and were subsequently released. Jamar wasn't sure if the multiple unmarked sedans parked on the corner and tailing him in traffic were FBI or Dewey's crew, or both. Regardless, none of it was supposed to have happened. Mike was supposed to be alive and Jamar was supposed to be sitting on a million dollars. In early March, Jamar stumbled into Flashdance at midnight. He wanted to see Duchess dance to Future and Kelly Rowland's Never End, get a drink, and pretend everything was okay. He was in the VIP section staring at the girls on stage while Duchess finished up a lap dance. She made her way through the crowd and sat beside him, placed her hand on his. She pointed with her chin to a solitary figure near the stage. You know that guy? He was an average-looking street guy. Nothing stuck out about him. Jamar didn't recognize him. Why? He's been asking about you. The guy didn't know Jamar's name, but he described his car right down to the emerald green metallic flakes, and he'd asked every girl in the club if they knew the owner. He'd been there for several hours drinking and talking. He said, there's a hundred thousand on your head, and he's going to cash that check. Jamar didn't know if it was the same guy that had killed Mike. However, he knew he was in danger. Duchess asked, you going to do something to him? I'm not hurting nobody, he grunted. I'm not the guy you think I am. Jamar slipped out of the club unnoticed. The next morning, Jamar found a sticky note on the driver's side windshield of his car that read, dead or alive. They knew where he lived. He thought about selling the vehicle, but he was afraid Dewey's crew would mistakenly kill the new owner, so he called ABC Auto and arranged to have the car crushed. Within days, he moved Zaire and the kids into a different apartment. Admittedly, after sitting only feet from his would-be killer, Jamar went a little crazy. He bought an AR-15 semi-auto assault rifle a Smith & Wesson 9mm semi-auto, a 45 caliber revolver, and enough ammunition to hold off the Florida National Guard. He purchased, at a dealership Duchess said was known for being cash-friendly, a brand-new BMW 750 Li straight off the assembly line, a German-engineered ultimate driving machine that purred like a kitten with a kick-ass sound system and a hand-stitched black leather interior. Agents McVeigh and Wilson received several tips from confidential informants that Mike's murder was connected to the Garda heist in Dewey, but hearsay isn't evidence. They couldn't get indictments based on rumors. Still, they wanted him off the streets. The only tangible evidence was the cash. Dewey was spending money with no substantial source of income. In addition, both his wife, Sean T. Hollis, and his girlfriend, Shanika Wilkins, were driving luxury vehicles and sporting pricey jewelry. In particular, Dewey and Shanti were living in the projects in an apartment stocked with expensive furniture and electronics, none of which she'd disclosed to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. 
As a result of the discrepancy, in April, the FBI raided Dewey and Shanti's apartment and had them both arrested for public housing fraud. During the agent's search for assets, they seized all the furniture and electronics. They checked vents and knocked holes in the drywall. That's our stuff, snapped Shanti as several agents toted off half a dozen flat-screen televisions. When McVeigh pulled the jewelry off her fingers and neck, he informed Shanti they'd return everything the moment she and her husband provided proof of their income. At the FBI's office, they leaned on Shanti hard. The agents told her she was facing a stiff federal prison sentence on the fraud charges. However, we can make it all go away, they said, if you cooperate against your husband. I ain't snitching out my man, she snapped. Ultimately, she got probation. Dewey wasn't so lucky. Due to his federal supervision, he was subject to a violation of supervised release and remanded to Jessup Federal Correctional Institution in Georgia, precisely what agents McVeigh and Wilson wanted. However, like his wife, Dewey wasn't talking. Jamar showed up at Flavors, a hole-in-the-wall strip club in Miami with a gorgeous 6-foot-5-inch, 21-year-old exotic dancer named Legs. He'd picked her up at another club earlier that week. Legs worked at multiple clubs. All the girls knew her. She was hard to forget. That's how Jamar met Brittany Mulan Tarpley. She was dancing on stage in her G-string and pasties, a voluptuous 5-foot-5-inch Bahamian beauty with bronze skin and straight hair, a couple of tattoos. She looked so good, Jamar gave the DJ 500 bucks to keep her on stage for three more songs. At the end of the night, while Legs was distracted talking to one of the other dancers, Mulan slipped her number into Jamar's shirt pocket. The number led to dozens of texts, which turned into several phone calls that sparked multiple rendezvous at hotels and nightclubs throughout Miami and West Palm Beach. A month into the relationship, Jamar, Mulan, and her best friend Crystal, also a dancer, were celebrating Crystal's birthday at the Miami strip club, The Office. The trio was drinking Grey Goose and Remy Martin cut with Red Bull. Jamar had over 10 grand in small bills, and the girls were shoving fives and tens into the exotic dancer's garters throwing money at their brethren, and having a blast. That was the problem, the money. Within an hour, every street thug, wannabe gangster in the place, was watching. Sometime after 2 a.m., one of the bouncers approached Jamar and yelled over the music. You need to get out of here. There were a dozen grim-faced men staring at him from the bar. Jamar was extremely drunk and not quite understanding the severity of the situation. He was feeling bulletproof. The bouncer looked at Mulan and said, you a man don't go now? He's going to get touched, robbed. Mulan and Crystal practically had to drag Jamar out of the club with the thugs slowly meandering behind. Once they were outside, not wanting the girls to think he was intimidated, Jamar slowly walked across the parking lot. Halfway to the Beamer, the grim-faced thugs rushed out of the club and jumped him. Jamar took several punches to the head. He swung back but ended up on the pavement. That's when Mulan reached into her purse grabbed a 9 millimeter lady, Smith & Wesson, and screamed, Back off or I'll kill every last one of you motherfuckers. The goons immediately scattered, including the two bouncers who were trying to break up the fight. Three of the thugs piled into a black Buick Regal. Jamar found his way behind the wheel of his BMW and they squealed down the street. When Jamar reached the I-95 on-ramp, Crystal noticed the black Buick from the club behind them. Jamar snaked through traffic, but the gap between the vehicles was closing. When the Regal reached the BMW, the driver swerved at the sedan. Crystal screamed. Suddenly, Mulan rolled down the passenger side window and pulled the 9mm out of her purse. She leaned out the window, aimed at the Buick, and fired off six rounds. The driver hit the brakes and yanked the wheel to the right in an attempt to make the turn for the on-ramp, but it was too late. The vehicle slammed headfirst into the yellow water absorption tanks. Jamar caught a split second of the Buick's hood crumpling and the explosion of water. Mulan dropped back into the passenger seat and slipped the smoldering weapon into her purse. Jamar thought, this chick's as gangsta as they come. With SWAT team-like precision, they swarmed out of the van and surrounded the armored truck. Doug McRae, played by Ben Affleck in the town, directed his gang of Charleston bank robbers with the professional grace of a conductor, using nothing more than hand gestures and clipped commands. In less than a minute, the guards gave up the cash and the crew was gone. Jamar recalled watching the movie in early July while laying in his bed at his apartment. Zaire was blowing up his cell. Nicole needed some money, and Mulan wanted him to drop by the club. But the only person he wanted to see was Mike. 
He would have known what to do. He'd make Jamar laugh. Jamar took a swig of cognac and his depression deepened. He still couldn't believe Mike was dead. An hour later, he woke up to the movie Takers. Ever cool Gordon Cozier's Elba and his gang were in the middle of a double cross. Over the next 30 minutes, Jamar watched as nearly the entire crew was gunned down by a rival gang and the LAPD. Why didn't I see this coming, thought Jamar. It was inevitable. Depression was sinking in and he was feeling suicidal again. The next morning, Jamar pulled into a parking space in the public's plaza near Roebuck Road, just as a Garda armored truck stopped at the ATM. It idled outside the grocery store's entrance and Jamar watched. The guard stepped out of the rear of the truck holding four cash reload canisters. He recognized the jumper, Omar Pianata. He'd worked for Garda for years. Jamar knew him well, but he didn't notice Jamar sitting in his vehicle 30 yards away. Omar was holding $200,000 in cash. Jamar's co-conspirators were dying and getting arrested. There was a price on his head. The money was dwindling. Zaire was furious with him. He was bouncing between multiple women, and the baby needed milk. Jamar wondered if Omar would recognize him with a mask. The tap on Jamar's window startled him. There were two older women standing outside his driver's window wearing long, drab dresses, holding Bibles, and religious pamphlets, a couple Jehovah Witnesses spreading the word. The senior of the two women tapped again, and Jamar lowered his window. She leaned down eye to eye with him. The Florida heat struck Jamar in the face at the same moment the woman said, Whatever you're planning, don't do it. Jamar nodded, and the two witnesses walked away. At the time, he didn't think much of it. A car horn sounded in the parking lot. Jamar wondered if his killer had finally found him. Not that he cared at this point. He glanced at his AR-15 semi-auto assault rifle leaning against the nightstand. It was 6 a.m., July 23, 2013, and he'd been awake for hours, listening to the whirling of the ceiling fan. His daughter's birthday was days away, and he was running low on cash. He hadn't been arrested like the others, but Jamar knew he was in danger. On numerous occasions, he'd driven by guys from the neighborhood, and they'd made the sign of a gun, their pointer and middle finger extended with their thumb cocked. They'd mock fire at him as he drove by. Bang, bang, you're dead. He thought about his family's safety. He thought about how to keep them safe. He thought about how to defend them. But Jamar wasn't a killer. Maybe I should just pack up everyone and move, he thought, get out of Florida. Regardless of what he decided, Jamar needed money. He knew the Garda routes, he knew the security procedures or lack thereof, and he knew the truck to hit. It contained between a million to 1.5 million at any given time. This time there'd be no problems, no mistakes, no double crosses. By 7.20 a.m., Jamar was sitting behind the wheel of his navy blue 2003 Chevy Monte Carlo with black rims and black tinted windows. The vehicle was registered in Jamar's name, but he'd partially obscured the tag. He'd purchased the Monte Carlo years prior when he was broke. He was parked behind the dumpster by the Home Depot Plaza on Okeechobee Road in West Palm Beach, five yards away from a Bank of America branch. Feds watching by two chains was blaring out of the speakers. At 7.30 a.m., Jamar heard the armored truck's brakes hiss to a stop. He glanced between the dumpsters. The truck was sitting in front of the ATM machine, just where he knew it would be. The adrenaline-infused blood coursing through his veins caused Jamar's hands to tremble as he turned off the stereo. People were laughing in the distance. He slipped on his gloves and rolled the black ski mask down his forehead. He pulled it taut over his face, revealing a twisted Joker's grin made up of three-inch tall white letters. Stretched across the mouth of the mask were the words, American Greed. Jamar grabbed the neck of the AR-15 assault rifle, slid across the front seat, popped open the Monte Carlo's passenger door. As he emerged from the vehicle, a bicyclist passed. Jamar must have looked like the angel of death, dressed entirely in black, grinning American Greed from ear to ear, tucked inside a hoodie with his assault rifle. The cyclist was so shocked he toppled over and slammed down on the asphalt a short distance from the Chevy. He scrambled to his feet, jumped on his bike, and raced off, never taking his eyes off the masked figure. Jamar ignored the racket, peeking over the dumpster and saw the guard, the jumper, exit the rear of the truck holding four cash reload canisters, each containing $50,000. He stepped onto the bumper, dropped to the asphalt, and headed toward the ATM. Jamar dropped behind the dumpster. He didn't recognize the guard. As Jamar waited for him to return with a canvas bag full of cash containing approximately half a million dollars, a woman in a minivan drove by. 
Some suburbanite soccer mom do-gooder. She looked him in the eye and reached for her cell. His level of anxiety spiked. Jamar looked at his watch and noted the time. It was now or never. Suddenly, he heard the ATM's door smack closed. It was time. Jamar came around the dumpster and bolted toward the armored truck. The guard had just opened the rear door when he spotted the armed figure. A ripple of fear ran through him. Drop the bag, yelled Jamar as he closed the distance between he and the guard. Drop it! Panicked, the guard froze for a fraction of a second. Then he jolted awake, released the bag, and dove through the partially open door. Jamar reached the rear of the truck and grabbed the door handle, knowing there was at least a million dollars in the rear of the truck. He tried to pull the door open as the guard tried to pull the door closed. The handle yanked away from Jamar, and he simultaneously squeezed the door handle and the grip of the AR-15, accidentally firing the weapon twice. The pop, pop, scared the hell out of Jamar and the guard. Somewhere behind them, a woman screamed. He forgot all about the cash in the truck, grabbed the bag, and took off running. By the time 911 started receiving calls of the robbery, Jamar had sped out of the strip mall's parking lot with half a million dollars in cash. He looked at his watch. The robbery had taken less than two minutes. As the West Palm Beach Sheriff's cruisers and choppers converged on the location, it appeared that, once again, he'd pulled off the perfect heist. Two sheriff's cruisers whipped by the Monte Carlo on their way to the Bank of America as Jamar drove down Belvedere Road. Then he saw three motorcycle patrol deputies, several vehicles behind him. However, they didn't seem to be following him. Jamar turned into a residential neighborhood near his uncle's house. He needed to get as far away from the vehicle as possible, as soon as possible. He made a quick left, a couple rights, and weaved between several blocks. Jamar didn't see anyone tailing him, so he pulled up to his uncle's house. That's when he noticed sheriff's cruisers pulling up to each end of the street, creating a perimeter. Seconds later, he saw multiple deputies jumping the neighbor's fences and heard the helicopter. It was over. Jamar recalled sitting in the back of a Palm Beach Sheriff's patrol vehicle with his wrists cuffed behind his back, sweat rolling down his face. His mother was standing behind another sheriff's cruiser with Zaire, Nicole, and his siblings. Agent McVeigh opened the door, squatted down, and said, 14 years, Mr. Towns. You're looking at 14 years, or you start talking to us. Over a month later, after Jamar had been processed by the deputies and locked up in gun club, after his mother and sister had shown up at the jail and cried and cried, after Mulan had written him a letter saying she'd missed her cycle, after Zaire had come to the jail and yelled at him for, once again, getting some heifer pregnant, after he'd been indicted by the government for the failed armored truck robbery, but not the 2012 Garda Cash Logistics Depot heist, Jamar was transferred to the federal building in downtown Miami, where Assistant U.S. Attorney Aurora Fagan, FBI agents McVeigh and Wilson, and Jamar's federal defense attorney, Andrew Strecker, were waiting for him. They wanted him to give up Dewey and Joe Rock for the cash logistics heist, for which he could have cared less about, and his sister for calling Dewey the night of the robbery and picking up the $300,000. But Jamar wouldn't do it. He wouldn't give up his sister. On his way to the holding area, McVeigh told Jamar, he was the agent in charge of Dewey's 1998 bank robbery case. He'd been sentenced to 30 years. However, Dewey had cooperated, received a Rule 35 sentence reduction, and served less than 10 years. I'm the agent that let him out, admitted McVeigh. He let the statement hang in silence, both of them knowing Dewey was responsible for Mike's death. It was a mistake, but Dewey Peterkind knows how the game's played. This guy's a piece of shit. And when we catch him, he's going to rat you out. Despite the evidence, to this day, Michael Sheffield's murder has never been solved. On January 9, 2014, Jamar was sentenced in federal court where his family told the judge he'd been the salutorian of his graduating class, he was attending Strayer University, he loved his children. The robbery of the armored truck was completely out of character for him. No one but Zaire and Ashley had ever suspected he'd been involved in the original Garda Cash Logistics Depot robbery, but none of that mattered. Jamar Towns was sentenced to 14 years, exactly what Agent McVeigh had predicted for the attempted robbery. Weeks later, he was flown to Oakdale Federal Correctional Facility in Louisiana. Jamar's sentence was calculated based on the $1.5 million contained inside the armored truck, not the half a million in the canvas bag, and for discharging his weapon, despite it being an accident. Jamar hadn't been in Oakdale a year before he, Daryl Dewey Peterkin, and Sikori Joe Rock Wilder were indicted for the 2012 cash logistics heist. 
Both Dewey and Joe Rock, hardened career street goons that prided themselves on being stand-up guys, cooperated immediately. They implicated Jamar as the inside man that put the entire score together, just like McVeigh said. However, Dewey refused to divulge the name of the man he'd hired to kill Michael Sheffield, and neither Dewey or Joe Rock would hand over the remaining $2 million in unrecovered cash. Jamar was flown back to Florida and housed at Gun Club. He had no idea why he was there until he saw Joe Rock and Dewey. On November 20, 2015, Jamar received an additional six and a half years on top of his current 14-year sentence. In early 2016, Dewey received 15 and a half years, and Joe Rock was given nine years. The seats in Coleman's visitation room are cold, hard plastic, non-flexible, and uncomfortable. Jamar's family visits him often, his mother, grandmother, Nicole, Brittany, Zaire, and his children. They spend hours driving up to the federal prison north of Orlando and another hour or two waiting to see him. They sit on the chairs surrounded by dozens of other inmates, murderers, gang members, pedophiles. They eat out of the vending machines and tell Jamar about their lives. Mostly, Jamar tells me during our final interview in October 2016. Zaire and I talk about how we're going to get through all this time. Zaire is not happy that Nicole and Brittany visit Jamar, but she tolerates it. There are children involved. Despite the other women, she still wants to marry him. I don't blame them, Nicole and Brittany, for loving him, she says. I love him. He's a good man. He just messed up. During a recent visit, Zaire told Jamar she'd seen Mike's father driving the El Camino around Riviera Beach. She wanted to stop him and tell him she'd known his son. She wanted to tell him Mike had always made her laugh. She missed him. But I couldn't bring myself to do it, she said. He looked so sad. You've just listened to Cash Logistics, The Perfect Inside Job Goes Sideways, written by Matthew B. Cox, narrated by Keith Madison Miller.